the Bethel Deliverance Outreach Ministries, known as BDOM. And this is my lovely wife. First Lady Wanda Walker. We're so glad to be here with you again today. This is our fourth week being on Facebook Live and something that I haven't done much of. And um, But at this time and season, um, it's a good outlet and platform to use to get the word out to the people of God. First of all, first and foremost, uh, I want to take time out to say, be safe out there, be careful. Continue to practice your social distancing, okay? And, you know, have your mask on when you go out, if at all possible, you know, because people are, are dying out here their hearts, and this is a very dangerous time. However, it's also a time of reckoning, an uh, important time of year as it relates to Jesus, the Son of God, coming to die for the sins of the world. And just before we get into that, okay, I'd like to also take this time out to thank my church, my family, uh, be done for um, your 20 years together with me um, that started actually in January and I know we was going to have a, you know, celebration in April and we weren't able to do that. Nonetheless, it doesn't take away the fact that God has blessed us to be together for 20 years and I thank you for that. I also want to thank you for your love gifts um, for not only my anniversary, but my wife and I birthdays and anniversaries. We thank you for that. I want to thank um, our senators and congressmen and county executives and all for their citations to me for 20 years. I thank you all so much. We're so humbled by that. And I really appreciate all that you do and all that you have done. Happy anniversary unto you. Okay? Thank the Lord. Today, we have a special lesson. And because it's special, I want you to grab, if you can, pencil and paper and maybe a marker. Because I'm going to open up something to you today that many of you have not heard before. And it may be a shocker to some of you. And some of you may be even tempted to shut me down once I open this up. But if you will hear me as I go through these scriptures, I'm going to open up a profound word unto you today. Okay? And I am excited to do that, though I contemplated it. I contemplated it for a number of reasons. One, people are looking forward tomorrow of the so-called Easter holiday celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And many people, many Christians, take that very seriously. And at this time, during this pandemic, sometimes you need something to be happy about. And for that cause, I was very hesitant about bringing this word. And I prayed God to ask whether or not should I bring this word in this season. Then, on the other hand, the season is perfectly aligned with the week of the resurrection, or rather the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's aligned perfectly. The week of it, the day he died of, the day he was put on the cross, everything. Okay? To open up your understanding about God's word and how man has changed God's divine plan to give us salvation through Christ Jesus. And he has done a masterfully job 
of overshadowing the true day that Jesus was put on the cross, died, and rose the third day. So today, we want to talk about that. I also want to thank my brother-in-law. He don't know that he actually encouraged me because as I was praying and contemplating this, I was talking to a minister friend of mine, and he and I both was talking about um, the times that we live in there, how people are hurting, and we want to give an encouraging word, you know, and, and that's what we wanted to do because of what we are facing out here. Then I talked to my brother-in-law, and he says, they call me Lonnie, Lonnie, preach the truth. Whatever you do, preach the truth. Because it's people like me. And what he mean like me, he's a new babe in Christ. He's trying to learn. He's trying to understand. Came from a rough background. He was also a, a Muslim. And Muslims don't believe in Jesus as our Savior because of this distorted word that the church is preaching that Jesus rose on Sunday morning. Okay? Now, Louis Farrakhan is not only a uh, Muslim leader, but he's also a historian, okay? And this man knows the, the, the history. So when the church, starting with the preachers, this hurts so bad, tell these lies and falsehood concerning the resurrection of Jesus and the Easter celebration of eggs and chocolate rabbits, dear hearts, this is an abomination in the eyes of God. It's an abomination. And when I lay down and got up, I can hear my brother-in-law saying, preach the truth. And that's what I aim to do today. Is that all right? So, that being said, we're going to have prayer, and we're going to go down in the Word. And I want you to be patient with me because I'm going to bring out some live things and going to show you um, according to Word. And, what, and that's what I said, according to Word. I'm not going to give you a commentary. You know what I mean by commentary? And when you ask a lot of preachers about Easter, Christmas, and all that, they'll start telling you, you know, what their thoughts are and, and all this kind of stuff. But nobody really gets scriptures to bring it out. I'm going to bring you scripture, pure word, along with history. You see here, I have what you call a Gregorian count, the Roman count that was given us. And you also uh, see the Jewish calendar. Okay? I'm going to give you the Jewish calendar. You also shall see the clock that the Jews used in that time. Okay? And there's also this diagram that you shall see. Okay? That the death, burial, and resurrection okay, of Jesus Christ and give you the three days and three nights that he was in the tomb. The chronological um, part of it, I mean of Jesus Christ. And I also got the scriptures going across to show you. Okay, and footnotes of the scriptures. Now, this is not something that Pastor Walker have uh, designed. If you see in the right-hand corner there, uh, these people here, WWWUCG, okay, uh, they are the one that put this together, and I saw it, and they was with 100% pinpoint accuracy, okay, to help with this. So we thank God for them having this calendar, this calendar available for us to look at and follow, okay? So, this lesson is not meant to be offensive, number one. I wanna get that out there. It's not meant to hurt you, okay? It is meant to open up your eyes and understanding how Satan, through subtlety, has taken, taken the Easter holiday and cause it to rise above and have more affluence than the true Passover, which God gave us in the beginning, 
okay, through the natural lamb, and then Jesus being the lamb of the world that died for us to take away the sins of the world. That shall be celebrated. That shall be celebrated. Okay? But instead, we are not. So, today, given that thought, okay, we are going to use for a thought the ignored sign. The ignored sign. I use that thought coming out of Matthew 12 and the 40th verse. That's where we're going to start. This is the sign that has been ignored by the scholars and by apostles and bishops, pastors of this time, of Jesus giving the only sign to prove that he is the Messiah and that he rose from the dead on the third day. Okay? The only sign. And as a subtitle, we're using the desecration of the Holy Week. Okay, this is God's holy week, and it's being desecrated, profaned by these lies, these fables, okay, and untruths, right? Now, look, when you look at desecrate, it means to violate a sacred place or thing, okay? When you look at the word profane, not, it means to not belong to what is sacred or biblical, not belonging to what is sacred or biblical. Easter is not sacred, neither is it biblical. There's one place in the Bible that speaks of concern, and I will break that down to you in Matthew, I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Acts 12, um, 4. Okay, we're going to break that down. Okay, so we need to be careful with making that which is unholy, holy and profane the whole system that God planned before the foundation of the world. Is that all right? Let us pray. Gracious Father, Lord God, again, we come before you to thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for how you kept us, Lord. We could have been dead, sleeping in our grave. Glory to God. Hallelujah, but you spared us and kept us one more time. We pray, God, that you open up the understanding, Lord, of your people, to give us the truth of your word, that we may stand on your truth. We pray that you touch every apostle, bishop, pastor, elder, that have influence over people, to stand up for the truth and preach the uncompromised word of God without fear or reservations. Give us spiritual authority and divine wisdom of your holy word. Touch the minds and hearts of your people, Lord, and put your truth in their minds, in their spirit, and in their hearts, that we may be a guiding light to the lost. Yes, Lord, and be able to give hope and the reason of the hope that's within us according to your word. In Jesus' name, our soul says, amen. And amen. Thank the Lord. We thank you so much. And again, I just want you to be a little patient with me. We're going to do some teaching here. Okay. A teaching that is really going to bless your soul. So we want to direct your attention to Matthew, the 12th chapter. Okay. And we want to start reading some uh, at the 38th verse. Okay. And our thought is going to come from the 40th verse. First lady, could you read something for me? Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we will see a sign from thee. So the scribe and the Pharisees wanted a, a sign of Jesus' Messiahship and being the Son of God. And this was Jesus' response. But he answered and said unto them, uh -huh. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now here Jesus is telling them, An evil, right, and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Right? But no sign shall be given them but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And what was that sign? Read. 
For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus here gave the sign of his Messiahship, church. Okay? Listen to me carefully, pastors, bishops. He gave the sign of his Messiahship that I will be in this grave for three days and three nights and I will get up. So what Jesus is saying here, right? A, he's proven that he is, right, the God of the living and the dead, the Savior of the world, right? And the hope of the saints that he will die and he will rise. Okay, this is the cornerstone of the church's belief. This is why we do what we do. This is why we suffer what we suffer because we believe that we are going to have eternal life and that we are going to rise from the dead. Look, there ain't no way in the world I'm going to suffer, right, and deny my flesh of all the good that it wants, at least it perceived good, you know, drinking, smoking, fornication, partying, you know. Lying, stealing. I mean, these things, I'm like, from a Christian, yeah, it's bad. But from a sinner, it's not. Okay? So to deny myself of that, what is God going to give me in place of that? And what he's promised to give me is eternal life. That if I die, this is not the end of me, that I'm going to rise. And that Jesus is my example and my hope. That I will rise. Okay? So Jesus stakes his messiahship on that not only is he going to die and rise, but he's going to assure himself of being dead by staying in the grave for three complete days and three complete nights. And after those three complete days and nights, he will rise. This is the whole of the Christian church. Okay? Now, Jesus did just what he promised that he would do. But because of man's teaching in the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope that give us a pagan holiday called Easter, which come from the word Ishtar, the god of fertility. Hmm? You got to remember that the Romans were initially pagans. And the Catholic Church is birthed out of Rome. Okay? Uh, if I get a chance, I get a chance to prove that I will. Uh, but I'm going to try to get through this. I might have to do a part two. Okay? This is what Daniel saw. Okay, when he saw the four kingdoms, the kingdom of Babylon, which was represented by the lion, right? The kingdom of the Medes and the Pays, Pays um, the Medes and the Persians, okay, right? That was represented by King Darius and Sars, okay? The Grecian kingdom, right? That was represented by Alexander the Great, and that fourth kingdom was the kingdom of Rome. That kingdom he saw fall and be divided and become ten kingdoms. Okay? Which is the European kings. Then he saw this little horn springing up, speaking great swelling words. That little horn that sprung up out of that Roman Empire was the papacy. Okay? That has given us all of these heathen days that the church embrace, the church embrace. Can you imagine God looking down on his preachers that is linking a pagan holiday with this holy Passover? Can you imagine that? They got a name for that. Huh? It's called syncretism. S-Y-N-C-R-E. 
T-I-S-M. You know what that is? Right? That is, listen to this in there. Right? You have a definition. I wrote it down for you so you will not be confused. The blending of pagan traditions and methods of worship with the true worship of God. Let me say that again. Syncretism. The blending of pagan traditions and methods of worship with the true worship of God. Something God strongly condemns. Huh? And he talks about it in Deuteronomy 12, 30 to 31, 2 Kings 17, through verses 7 through 18. Right? Now, when you syncretize something, you, you, you unify or reconcile two schools of thought. Okay? So you're reconciling a heathen holiday, okay, with a true and holy day of God. That is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, tomorrow, because of leaders, and this will make it an abomination, because the preachers, God's representatives, are the main one propagating, spreading the lie. Calling a pagan holiday holy. And our governor, Governor Hogan, he got all of us quarantined, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But yesterday, he said he's going to release the bunny. <laughs> yeah. This is a government official. He's going to release the bunny. Okay. Yeah. So the bunny can do his thing, help, you know, help make Easter a great Easter. Come Monday, the president is going to have Easter egg hunt. You know what these people are doing? They're making it difficult for you to stand for the truth by tying these pagan lies to your kids. And you don't want to hurt your kids. So you stay in this pagan worship and pagan teaching for the sake of your kids. Now, I understand it. I, I truly do. Because when I was a kid, that was one of the things we looked forward to because that's probably the only time when I got a new suit. I come from a large family. It was 13 of us. Okay? Parents didn't make that much money. Father was an automobile candidate. My mother was a domestic. Okay? So, but because of that holiday, they made special sacrifices to buy you a new suit. My sisters, I had seven of them. My mother was a beautician. That was one of the times when she would press their hair out. And some of you that's been around a little while, you know the old school way, man. They had a, a straight comb. They put that thing on the fire. And they had some curls. Uh, and man, my mother would grease that hair down, boy, and take those, that high iron. And that thing would straighten that hair, boy. You talking about perm. <laughs> yes, sir. That was perm, but I, but I was perm stuff, baby. Them old folks put that thing on you. You know, my mama, she wants, she got the bees all on your neck. You know, you can see everything was pressed out. Yes, it was. So the girls' hair would look good, and they put them in them Shirley Temple curls. You know what I'm saying? Oh, they looking so good. Had the pastel colors, pink, yellow, white. Uh, how many of y'all young ladies remember that? The parents putting you in those pretty colors. Then they put you in those little pet leather shoes, little girls. Sometimes it would be white, little pet leather shoes just shining. Or black, right? Then you get a chance to go to church on that day, right? They give you some money until you put 50 cent on in, the, on in the pan. You put a quarter in there and keep a quarter, right? <laughs> 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 uh, these are things that this is tradition. So this, what I'm showing you is this tradition followed us from a kid never really learning the truth about God. Holy day. And we made Easter the holy day of God. Right? Desecrating the true Passover lamb, which was Christ Jesus, who died for us. The first lamb in Exodus 12, 
was killed for us. That lamb, okay, had to, well, let's, let's touch on that a little bit. Let's go get Exodus 12. Let's touch on this a little bit, just to get the origin. Now, I'm doing this for a reason, right? Getting the origin. You know why I'm doing this for a reason, getting the origin from the Bible? Because you can't do that for Easter. If we're going to promote Easter's pastors, you need to be able to give people line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. You cannot do that with Easter. But I can run Passover from Exodus clean through your New Testament. Over to the time of Jesus, he kept it. After Jesus, apostles kept it. But there's nowhere in Scripture where they kept Easter. Why are we keeping it? Why is the church that supposed to be the institution of truth, truth, spreading lies? How? Now let me say this, because this is important. Some truly don't know. Because this holiday was here hundreds of years, thousands of years, before any of us was born, and that is including your preachers. And like anything else, when you're in Rome, you do what Romans do. We don't take time to really research stuff that's been a hard day as, and taught as far as you can remember. So you just take it for granted. It's the sheep instinct in people. Okay? And we as preachers are not exempt from the sheep instinct wherein when things are passed down to us from our leaders, and the leaders before our leaders, and the leaders before that, but you can trace this thing back pretty far. Okay? We teach it without knowing that we are in error. So, when you hear this teaching and this breakdown of this word, I don't want you to call your preacher a fake, a liar, and intentionally trying to deceive you, because many are not. Some and I will say quite a few do not know what I'm getting ready to do today and get ready to break down to you today. And I have these timelines and things broken down for you so that you, not only the general public, but the preacher as well, can print this out and study it, okay? And take it, you know, home with you and, and, and make it an angry study. I study it all the time, okay, and study the word all the time. Okay, so I need to bring out the origin and the purpose of the origin so you can know the significance, okay, of this institution of the Passover. Okay, first lady, um, read something for me, start at the first verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, uh -huh. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It should be the first month of the year to you. Hold it right there. This is very important, what God spake unto Moses. Now, I want you to understand what God is doing. He is establishing the sacred year, okay, in the sacred month of Israel. Let me tell you how smart God is and intelligent God is. When God established these holidays or holy days, he didn't do it according to a Roman calendar, a Gregorian calendar, but he did it according to the lunar calendar. You know why? Because God can time by the clock the setting of the new moon. That new moon is going to show up precisely. And for that reason, all of his holy days are established by the new moon. Okay? So, he said, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Okay? So, if you go to 
uh, let's look at, uh, I believe, verse 13 and 4. Exodus 13, 4. Just one, one verse. I want you to hold that where I just came from, right? Because I'm going to show you what that new money, that beginning of money is. Look at the fourth verse of Exodus 13. This day came ye out in the month Abir. Abir, in our language, is April. So he's telling them that the month of April is going to be the beginning of months, not January. Not January. That's our heathen count. Okay? But April is the beginning of months, uh, according to God's holy people. Okay? So he's telling me here that this month, the month of April, shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The very first month of the year. Okay? Now watch this. All right? This is so amazing. When that month come in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come in by the new moon. When the new moon come in, it's going to be the beginning of the month, which is in the spring of the year. When I took the, the supper on the 13th at Eve, which was the beginning of the 8th, which was the beginning of the month of Abel, all right? My cameraman was leaving. And when we was walking out the door, it was around 1030. I looked up and there it was. God was true to his word. The new moon was right there. Mm -hmm. uh, which started the month of April, according to the Jewish calendar. Not this calendar, but the Jewish calendar. And every subsequent holy day from that point, right, which hadn't been established yet. This is the first one. It's going to come in following that new moon because it's going to set the tone for the year and cause every feast day to be precisely on point without fail. That is very important for you to know because I'm going to bring that back up down in the lesson. Okay, go a little further. Exodus 12 and 3. Mm-hmm. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, uh -huh. they should take to them every man a lamb, mm -hmm. according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Mm -hmm. And if the household be too little for the lamb, mm -hmm. let him and his neighbors next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Uh -huh. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. It has to be a male. It is a male because this lamb is a type of Christ. Okay? So this ordinance is pointing to our Savior. Okay? So that's why it couldn't be a female lamb. It has to be a male lamb. It has to be without blemish because Christ is without sin. Okay, now they don't know this. We do now that Christ has come, but they didn't know what God was doing. Okay, so this is important to establish the origin of Passover in the Holy Week. Okay, go a little further. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat, uh -huh. and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day. Of the same month. Hold it right there. This is also important. Okay? Because this is, again, I say a type of Christ. Christ is the antitype, which means he is not the type, but he is to fulfill the type. Okay? So God is establishing here that this lamb must die on the 14th day. So if Christ is the antitype, he must also die on the 14th day, according to this scripture. Okay? And whenever that 14th day fall, okay, that is the beginning of your new year. And that is the time when you should have your Passover. 
Not every Sunday, which is Easter or man's Easter. So right there, right there, that refute, that teaching. You understand that? Uh-huh. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Second point. This is important. If Christ is to mirror this type, he has to die in the evening. Is that right? He has to die in the evening. Right? Not only that, right? This 14th day is going to be a memorial that is to forever be kept by Israel. Are you hearing me? So, again, he has to die in the evening. You notice when they put Jesus on the cross, okay, Jesus didn't die that morning, though they put him on the cross that morning. Because he must meet this type. He must meet it. Okay? Now, read. And they should take of the blood mm -hmm. and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses. Uh -huh. Wherein they shall eat it. Read. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Mm -hmm. Roast with fire and unleavened bread. Uh -huh. And with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Hold it right there. Now. That blood had to be striked on the doorpost and other lintel. This is the, the, the origin of the Passover. And the ordinance of you had to obey what God told you to do it and how he told you to do it. You can't add to it. You can't take away to it, uh, from it. How is it that we're adding to when he got up, when he laid down, and then going to give him a day of, of Easter, calling it Easter, that has nothing to do with this holy ordinance. That's why we are desecrating it. As important as this is, this is a type of our Savior coming to die for the sins of the world. And it's being overlooked by Easter Bunny. A, 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 a chocolate Easter Bunny. Every kid tomorrow is going to be looking forward to a bunny and an egg and not Christ. They're going to go to church, the institution where the truth is supposed to be, and the lie be enforced. Do you not know you are setting our kids up to not believe in Christ when they find out that that ain't really true? Just like they did with the food, the, 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 the tooth fairy. Just like they did with Santa Claus coming down the chimney. How is the church embracing all these lies? Who can the people believe? And then the man who we talk about, Louis Farrakhan, is the very one that's teaching that truth. Now, who is the liar? Come on, church. He noticed like the back of his hand. That's why you can't only get a Muslim to follow a church. Because they think we fake. Because the history can bear them out that what we're saying is a lie. And because the history can bear them out. Because the history can bear them out. It'll make them seem more true than us as Christians. Because the history can't bear Easter out. Not scripturally. It can't do it. It can't do it. And where did we get the Easter egg from anyway? What did that have to do with Christ? Where did we get the bunny from? What did that have to do with Christ? Do you know the history of those things? Now you, you, you got your kids now rather looking forward to the partaking of the bread which represents his body, okay, in the wine, some use grape juice that represents his blood, they're not looking forward to that tomorrow. They're looking forward to an Easter egg. 
which Babylonian, Egypt, and all of them heathen countries done. Got our kids polluted in this falsehood. And after the passion of Christ, and just think of the movie, The Passion of Christ. You remember that movie? When he was beat unmercifully? Unmercifully. You could hardly watch the movie. And that about him is being overshadowed because of an egg and a chocolate bunny. That is not being exalted by how our Savior paid this awesome price for our sin. Be all night long for our sin. Spit on for our sin. Made a mockery to the world for our sin. Only to be overshadowed that history by an Easter egg bunny and an Easter egg and a lie that he rose on Sunday morning. morning. He rose. He did rise. And he was in the ground for three days and three nights. But he did not rise soon Sunday morning. And have you ever thought about why Sunday is so important? Where they get that from? Why? Why it has to be on Sunday? All this stuff to us is tied to paganism. All of it. We got to stop this mess. Starting with the top. Pastors who have a responsibility, according to the word, to cry loud, to spare not, to lift thy voice up like a trumpet and show my people their sins. Huh? That's our responsibility. And we going to propagate the lie? Take it further? Come on now. We got to do better than this. We are the front line of the truth. Tell it. If we don't tell that truth, according to Ezekiel 33, we're going to pay a price. Yeah, they might die in their sin, but their blood God going to require at our hand. Do you want that? Or do you want the money that they're going to bring in on Sunday morning? Because those are the main two days they really flood your church. Monday, I mean, uh, Christmas and Easter. Big money-making days for the church. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going to look forward for the dollar? Or are we going to tell the truth? Go, little friend. Eat not of it raw. Eat not of it raw. Nor sodden at all with water, mm -hmm. but roast with fire, mm -hmm. his head with his legs, uh -huh. and with the pertinence thereof. Really? And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Mm -hmm. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, mm -hmm. your shoes on your feet, mm -hmm. and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. And what it is, is this? the Lord's Passover. That's the origin right there. I can establish the origin of the Lord's Passover. Okay? Jesus was to mirror that. Okay? This, this lamb was also pointing to the salvation that was coming through Jesus Christ, him paying the price and dying for our sin. Okay? Now, for Israel, the natural lamb was given to them because that was the type. But Jesus has come now. We no longer need a type. He is the image. So now the lamb is here. And I can prove that according to scripture. That's John 3. I mean, Matthew 3. He said, behold, the lamb of God, take away the sins of the world. Right? So he's our lamb now. All right? Paul told us over there in 1 Corinthians, okay, 5 and 7, the Lord is our Passover. So we still should be celebrating Passover because the Lord is ours. Not Easter. Not Easter. Passover. Or 
the Lord's Supper. One of the two did. Because Jesus took it and he changed the eminence. That's all he changed. He didn't change the time or the season. Jesus took it around the same season according to this word. It has to be. He has to. He has to take it according to this word. All Jesus did was change the emblems. And why did he change the emblems? Because he's instituting a new testament. Okay? He has to institute it, and it cannot be a force until after he died. Huh? That's according to the word. A testament is not a force until after the death of the testator. So Jesus had to do some things prior to his death. Okay? So for the New Testament church, okay, Jesus is our Passover, and he's instituting a new covenant. And because it's a new covenant, he changed the emblems. Because the emblems now represents, the bread represents his body, and the wine represents his blood that was going to be shared. And that's what we ought to be teaching. And Paul said, and he is our Passover. He didn't say he is our Easter. Is that in your book anyway? He is our Easter. Come on now. He's our Passover. This is the origin. Now drop down to the 14th verse. Let me show you something. And this day shall be unto you uh -huh. for a memorial. Do it when you want to do it. Do it sometime. Do it when you feel like it. No, this is a memorial. Or it's a memorial for the Jews. But Jesus is our Passover. And he took it the same time as the Jews. The Jews have a dual celebration. A, this day will forever be with them. It cannot be erased. Because this one, God introduced himself to them in the world. In the world. Just like he's doing today. Showing all our leaders all over the world, that he is God. Uh, by causing a pestilence to come in this land. And no power, no superpower can do anything about it. Pharaoh was the superpower of this time. And he could do nothing about this plague. And the only way that they could be delivered from the plague was through the blood. And the only way that we can be delivered from our sins is through the blood. Is that all right? So God told them to keep this as a memorial. Uh-huh. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord. It shall be a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generation. Throughout your generation. That means up to now. Uh-huh. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. For how long? Forever. Is that in y'all Bible that's following me? Now, when Jesus, check this out, well, we ain't got to do that now, because see, Jesus came, and Jesus died for us. He's the New Testament. Yeah. And he died on the 14th day. And he is our Passover. And he gave us a new ordinance. We don't need the lamb. The new ordinance is the bread and the wine that should be kept as an ordinance forever. Because we are his messianic Jew. And we should be given that message. Not about Easter. Not about Easter. It is supposed to be kept as an ordinance forever. Okay? Then drop down to the 17th verse because this is also important. Read. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Say so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day uh -huh. have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations for an ordinance forever. You see that? So this is important because I'm going to bring out the three days and three nights based upon that verse right there to show you that that verse, if you go over to Leviticus 23, will show you that that particular ordinance, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the following immediately after the Sabbath, I mean after the Passover, was that Sabbath day, was that preparation Sabbath day. Okay? So I want to just establish that. 
right there. Is that all right? Okay. So, read one more verse. In the first month. In the first month. On the 14th day of the month. Which is at April. Even, the 14th day at even. You shall eat unleavened bread. Uh-huh. Until the 1 and 20, 20th day of the month at even. Now look. Even. Even. I can't get all the scriptures at one time because there's a lot of scriptures I would like to talk about. Some of them I had to quote, some of them I had to go to. But in Leviticus 23, God gave them seven holy days. Okay? They were also called holy convocations. No severe work could be done on those days. Right? They were also called Sabbath days. Okay? So, they didn't necessarily fall on the seventh day of the week. Whenever that day fell, according to the lunar calendar, they should have what you call a Sabbath day. You ask any Jew about a high day, and they'll tell you about those seven holy days that God gave them, which was also called Sabbath days. Okay? But they did not necessarily fall on the seventh day of the week. Any day that they fall on, according to their lunar calendar, that particular day will be called a Sabbath day. Okay? And more than likely, because it is according to that lunar calendar, right? More than likely, those days will either fall on the seventh, the fifteenth, the 22nd or the 29th. And it's clockwork. Why? Because it's done by the lunar calendar. Right? It's done by the lunar calendar. Are y'all following me? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. What it says? Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your house. Uh-huh. That's enough of that. Okay. Now let's go back to the three days and three nights. Okay, the three days and three nights. This is very important. Okay, now I want you to go to Mark 15. I'll bring out some things on this three days and three nights. Mark 15. Mark 15. One. Uh, yeah, let's, let's start at one. And I'm going to show you something right quick. Uh huh, read. And straightway in the morning. The chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Now look at this now. Your chief priests, your religious people, right? Your elders, right? And scribes and the whole council bound Jesus, carried him away and delivered him to the heathen. <laughs> okay? Read. And Pilate asked him, uh -huh. Art thou the king of the Jews? See? And he answered and said unto them, Thou sayest it. Mm -hmm. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. He didn't answer because he has to fulfill the, the prophecy that's written of him concerning him not answering a word in Isaiah 53. So Jesus had to fulfill all these prophecies to prove that he is the Messiah. Along with Getting up after three days and three nights. Uh -huh, read. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answers thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witnessed against thee. Mm -hmm. But Je Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. And that's what Isaiah says. Say, he answered them, not a word. Uh huh. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. Mm -hmm. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. Now hold on a minute. Here is a heathen trying to set up a scheme to free our Savior. But the church folk mm. didn't see him. Who are the people propagating these lies? The church foe. Come on, church, this is embarrassing. It's hurting. We doing the same thing that they did. 
And here a man who ain't supposed to be of God, like we look at Louis Farrakhan, see it clearly that we're in error. It's repeating itself. It's repeating itself. Read. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. Mm -hmm. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now see, he just knew they was going to say yeah. He want him released. Right? So he know that they going to choose the thief mm -hmm. and the murderer. All right? And here he gets surprised. And he the even. Read. For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. He knew what? The chief priest. He didn't even know it. Yeah, this mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Stay with me, church. Stay with me. I'm taking you through these scriptures line upon line. Precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. I'm trying to show you how the church today is mirroring the church of yesterday. They're doing the exact same thing. Read. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. You see who moved the people? The priest. The same one that are moving the people to keep Easter. The preachers. People believe in the lie because of us. Mm -hmm. The priest said, move the people against Jesus. Where power, the heathen, is trying to find a way to release them. Who's blind? Church, we got to change. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. How are you going to do that when we're lifting up lies? And false doctrine. And untruths. And what makes it an abomination? We are exalting it above the truth of God. So you saw where the Feast of Unleavened Bread would start that first day and it would end or go on for seven days. That make it a holy week. Right? It's been desecrated by us, by Papan people, to celebrate Easter. On the holy week of God. The desecration of the holy week. Now you see where I'm going. Now you understand. This whole week. Supposed to be about that passion of Christ. And you know what that unleavened bread represent? Right? They told him to. Excuse me. God told Moses to instruct the people. To. Take the lamb out on the tenth, kill him the fourteenth day at Eve. Right? Tell him, say, look here. Eat it with your shoes on, your lawns girded, because you got to eat it in haste. Right? Because they had to eat it in haste, the leavened bread, right, was not going to rise. Right? Leaven, for you can understand this, leaven makes bread rise. It changes the contour or the construction of the bread. When you put in leaven, it causes it to rise. It changes it, right? That bread, right, to us represents Jesus' body when it went in the ground. The normal process of a person dying, they begin to decay and change. That's what leaven do to bread. It changes it. The leaven bread represents Jesus' body was not going to change. Okay? It was not going to change. David foresaw this in Psalms. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is by my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart was glad. My tongue rejoiced. Right? Watch this. Because thou will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. See what I'm saying? In other words, his body was not going to change. Right? See? Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Look at this. Let me break that down to you. Let me slow it down. 
Thou will not leave my soul in hell. So David saw the resurrection. He saw the hope of the saints. Right? Not dying and it's the end of their life. So thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thy suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's seen Jesus' body not changing in the ground and become decayed. You can understand that? So the unleavened bread represents that. And you see how this is not being brought out? That it's being overshadowed by our Easter bunny? The preachers of the day ought to be teaching when we die, it's not over. Uh, we should be standing up telling the folks that got the coronavirus and died. It's not over. Telling their loved ones, it's not over. Glory to God. Uh, it's not over. That's what Jesus tried to show Peter, James, and John when he took them to the Mount Transfiguration. And he, he, they, they saw him up there. And they saw him with Moses uh, and Elijah. And Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Uh, glory to God. So when he looked at it, he said, let us build three tabernacles. Huh? One for you, so I'm saying, one for him, one for thee. Right? But Jesus didn't break down to him what he was trying to show him. Huh? That he is the God of the living and the dead. You see, Moses represented the saint that died. Huh? And Elijah represented the saint that didn't die. He was translated. Uh, glory to God. So Moses represented the one that was going to be resurrected if we die. And Elijah represented the one that was still alive and remained. Glory to God. So that's what Paul meant when he said the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Uh, that trump is one of the feast days. Glory to God. Feast of trumpets. Good God Almighty. Uh, that thing got to happen. Huh? Are you hearing me? Those feast days are going to come in handy. Thank the Lord. Watch this there. And the dead in Christ is going to rise first. That's what Moses represented in the Mount of Transfiguration. Then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what Elijah meant, uh, represented, because Elijah was translated and did not see death. Uh, he was carried away in the chariot. So Jesus trying to show them in the Mount of Transfiguration that I am the God of the quick, which represented Elijah that never died, and the dead that represented Moses. Good God Almighty. Huh? Hallelujah. That's what we ought to be preaching, pastors. Thank the Lord. Not about Easter. Huh? Glory to God. But our loved ones that die, gonna get up again. Huh? Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep, but we should be changed in a moment, in a training of the eye. Glory to God. Huh? At the last trump, there it is again, feast day trump. Glory to God. Huh? This mortality is gonna put on immortality. And this corruptible is gonna put on incorruption. Huh? And when this corruptible had put on incorruption and this mortality had put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Glory to God. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? Let me tell you something. That message is compromised when we tell a lie that Jesus was died on Friday and rose on Sunday. Huh? Jesus said that he's supposed to be in the ground three days and three nights. Which means that's not three days and three nights. So if that's not three days and three nights and we're preaching that, you have distorted the whole resurrection message and caused the hope to be lost. Mm -hmm. The desecration of the Holy Week and our Holy Savior. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my God. Church, I'm about to give you a part two. I am so sorry. My time is up. Lord have mercy. Lord be willing i try to come back next week. Same place. Same time. I hope you got something out of this word. Be sure to tune in next week, guys. I'm not over. I am just getting started. Uh, I'm glad I was able to end that thing on a high note. Good God Almighty. Ooh, I, got, I feel his presence right now. Uh, come back. I'm going to show you the resurrection. Matter, matter of fact, you'll get a chance to study it right there. So when I come back, you'll be able to follow me. Is that all right? I'm going to show it to you on the Jewish calendar. I'm going to show it to you on, a, on uh, the Gregorian calendar, which is the calendar we use. Uh, and I'll go back to the scriptures. I'm going to show you where we get some of these here. Uh, where, where did we get this here feast day? Uh, oh, I'm not that feast day, but this the Easter celebration jump. Okay? Whew, Lord, have mercy. I'm so excited. I hope God has, has blessed you today. Bless your mind. Bless your heart that you got something out of this here. I love you. May heaven smile upon you. 
Peace be unto you. God bless you.